visitors from outer space. They crash land without warning and can lie buried for thousands of years. Oh my goodness. Jeff Notkin and Steve Arnold live to unearth them. They are oh yeah. the meteorite men. On this adventure, Jeff and Steve secure access to one of America's famed sites, the 62,000-year-old Odessa Crater in West Texas. This is a protected site. You can't just show up here and go, is it okay if I hunt for meteorites? No, you can't. Look at this, buddy. Under a scorching sun, they gear up with the latest in search equipment for big, Texas-sized iron space rocks. If there's anything left, it's big and it's deep. Well, we've got the stuff to find big and deep stuff. If we found an iron meteorite out here weighing 300 pounds or more, it'd be worth $100,000. It'd rock our world. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> <laughs> The... Morning, Odessa. Hot out there today. Could reach 105. Watch out for them rattlesnakes. <laughs> this is one of the great meteorite sites in the world. Getting permission to come in and hunt is is really it's once in a lifetime. Odessa, there it is. I haven't seen that sign in many years. Jeff Notkin and Steve Arnold are on a hunt for Texas black gold of a different kind. Massive iron meteorites worth tens of thousands of dollars. Welcome to the Stringfield. Ah, <laughs> oh, this is great. For months, they've sought special permits to hunt on the sacred ground of Odessa's meteorite crater. A whopping 550 feet across, it's one of only two craters in the U.S. where iron meteorites have been found. The Odessa crater was blasted out of the Earth's surface about 62,000 years ago in a cataclysmic explosion three times more powerful than the atomic bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. We've got a big rock that probably stayed together for the most part until the very end. There is a tremendous explosion at the time of impact, which is believed to destroy most of the incoming mass. The upheaval threw pieces all over. And so we don't have little ones at one end and big ones at the other. They're most likely all mixed in pretty haphazardly. So we would expect them to be roughly in a circular pattern around the actual impact site. The area where meteorites land is called a strewn field. Over the millennia, the crater filled in, leaving only a faint outline. Since first being recognized as a meteorite crater in the 1920s, more than 1,500 pieces have been taken by professionals and tourists. The biggest, close to 300 pounds. All public hunting has been halted for years in an effort to preserve the area. The coolest thing about being able to hunt at the Odessa Crater is that nobody else is allowed to. This is a protected site. You can't just show up here and go, is it okay if I hunt for meteorites? No, you can't. You can't hunt in the crater or near it. The local landowners don't want to be bothered. They've had people poaching on their land for decades. It's just not going to happen. If we found an iron meteorite out here weighing 300 pounds or more, the... Worth $100,000? It'd rock our world. A major discovery. And there's an opportunity to maybe find a really big rock here. Uh, we've been told if there's anything left, it's big and it's deep. Well, we've got the stuff to find big and deep stuff. Whoa! To increase their odds, the guys have amassed over $500,000 worth of search gear, a specialized military bomb detector. That'll make me feel like uh, I'm in a funeral march. A magnetic gradiometer that can pinpoint a piece of iron the size of a baseball 15 feet underground picking up the fence pretty good. A mobile ground-penetrating radar system. Now, does this just go straight down? Um, actually, it makes a cone shape. A cone shape. And their low-tech PVC deep earth detecting sled, all attached to the Rockhound, their high-tech multi-purpose amphibious vehicle. That's where the target is. I don't want you to put tire marks over the top of the target. The hunt is on. <laughs> Whoops. And the only real question is, where do they start? There may be something here. If it is, it'd be, it'd be quite, quite big. 
They've enlisted Dr. Mark Everett, a prominent geophysicist who used a magnetic radiometer to create a precise map of the crater, highlighting the tiniest changes in the Earth's magnetic field caused by the violent impact. What I plotted here is what I call the erratic readings. Each one of these could be caused by some little tiny object in the ground, but there's something over here. Wow. And these are the largest uh, uh, signals that we get. So it could be okay. something either side of the fence line, but that's an area we might want to investigate, okay. as well as these two areas down here. Armed with Dr. Everett's research, the guys decide the crater rim will be search area number one. Jeff wants to search the rim right away because of an old story he heard. I'll hold that for you until you're ready for it. Steve was poo-pooing me earlier, but there's this legend or rumor that there's a very large iron mass that was detected just about at the extreme rim of the crater, maybe back in the 50s. Because they're looking for big rocks, they pull out the big gun, the EM-63 military-grade unexploded ordnance detector. This is a UXO detector, primarily. It's a, it's a metal detector. UXO is unexploded ordnance, and it's designed for looking for, for unexploded uh, bombs. Genius. The hope is that it can look deep to see what those marks on the map mean. OK, this is about the area where I think we get our largest magnetic readings, somewhere in this area here. The EM-63 transmits electromagnetic pulses deep into the ground. When those pulses pass through a metallic object, an electromagnetic force is induced in the target, which allows the operator to read and record the magnetic signature, which can reveal its size, shape, and orientation using the onboard computer. Here's our little line, the readouts. And what we're hoping for is a nice spike that goes up through one, two, three lines. That's what Mark told us to look out for. Got anything for me to dig? Not yet. Oh, I got a little spike there. Let's try that again. It was, may have been right when I went over those little bushes there. Oh, yeah. OK, I'm going to back it up and try that again. No. This is uh, one heavy rig. It doesn't look like it. It's really hot. Oh, I'm a bit tired from pushing that. Do you want me to try and set that setting so you can see smaller objects with this? We want to see the big one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I mean, thanks. OK. Right. Wow, these black boxes get really hot. So you should try pulling it instead of pushing it. I know there's a big one out here. I can, I can feel it. I like how you keep it on a straight line there, Jeff. I'm ad-libbing. All right, I'm going to give this one last whirl, and then uh, I'm going to have to take this backpack off before I develop some sort of weird muscular problem. Ouch. <sighs> to make the most of their time, Steve grabs his trusty personal metal detector, a $2,500 piece of equipment that's found tens of thousands of dollars more worth of meteorites. We'll give it a try. At least until Jeff finds us something bigger to dig on. Not quite as sophisticated as the EM-63, it operates on the same general principle. A signal is sent out, and if metal is detected, the signal returns. It's lower tech, but can still work wonders. While Jeff bakes in the sun with the heavy equipment, Steve takes a chance near a working oil well. Here we go. And this looks like one. Wow. Nah. Look at that. You wouldn't think that something with wheels would be this heavy. Oh, Jeff is going to be so jealous. OK, funeral pace walk. This is a little sculpted Odessa. Right here in the middle of the junk. It's a cutie. Do the little happy dance. All right. This is my first one for the day. Hopefully not the last. Steve has bagged the first find of the hunt, but Jeff is striking out in his search for big targets on the crater rim. Not a thing. The fact that there are any pieces left of the meteorite that hit here about 62,000 years ago is the result of an extraordinary set of circumstances. Most bodies in space are sand size, maybe even smaller. It's just a blip of, of a, a little streak. Those, those happen all the time and don't create anything. And then you have the, the meteors that are large enough 
to create a crater, but they're so big that they 100% destroy the rock. Then there's this really narrow amount um, a dozen, maybe 15 known craters on the planet that are big enough to cause a crater, big enough to destroy most of the rock, but not all of it. That's the category we're in here, the, the rarest of the rare. The hunt for rare rocks moves to area number two, the next concentric circle of the strewn field. This area is over the fence line and into private property they got exclusive permission to hunt. The guys are hopeful that this area may produce, since it's not been searched as extensively as the public land. You can measure a certain distance from the crater and draw a line around it and go, well, we should hunt all of this, all of this ground around the crater. I got some here. Right away, there is a hit in area two. Hey, no fair, I don't even have my detector set up yet. How are you always not ready? <laughs> because time is precious, temperatures are rising, and the territory vast. They trade the EM-63 for their more nimble metal detectors. Woo, 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 woo. It's the metal detector song. Oh, this is what it was. I would guess that there are pieces probably up to two miles from the crater. There could be a 100, a 200. There could be a 500-pound rock out here. Wow, I've never heard it chatter like this. Yeah, something's interfering, Jeff. Nothing in meteorite hunting is without challenge. This is oil country, and there's a lot more than dirt and rocks under this scrub brush. This place is full of bullets. This southwest heat is just brutal. What's that? Oh, come on. <laughs> really? It was a big piece of wire. It was just hidden in the, in the brush there, right on the top. I must have sunstroke. I tell you what, it's over 100 degrees, and it is still getting hot. It is hot, but the real danger is the field itself. This land is crisscrossed with old and new oil and gas pipelines. If it's an active oil pipe and you hit it hard with a pickaxe, probably wouldn't be a good end to the day. <laughs> The explosion that blasted out the Odessa crater about 62,000 years ago sent iron meteorites flying in a circular pattern, possibly as far as a mile away. Yeah, this looks exactly like ejecta thrown out of the crater. Look at all these white fragments all around here. Yeah. So it would be kind of nice to find a meteorite next to it. If the guys can unearth a big iron, it would be well worth the dig. The value of anything over 100 pounds skyrockets into the tens of thousands of dollars. We could use a backhoe. You win the backhoe. Bring wow. the backhoe. Get the backhoe. We need the backhoe. I'll let you dig for a little bit, and we'll see how long it'll be I'm before you call in the backhoe. <laughs> yeah, a backhoe's here. a real bad idea, isn't it, Jeff? I caught something I can't even budge. Hold on a second. Oh, my goodness. That looks very man-made to me. Oh. It is a pipe. Yeah. But it's the end of it. It's like just one piece. Oh, man. I go and get all excited. You get a strong signal, and you start digging. Oh, wow, I really got something this time. And then clunk, and suddenly you see this very, very round, smooth meteorite, which is, in fact, an oil pipe. Do we want to even try to get it out? No, we can leave it for the next generation of meteorite hunters to dig okay. up. All right, let's cover it back up. <sighs> oh, well. Oh, well. When prospectors first started to hunt Odessa, it was widely believed there was a huge iron meteorite the size of a school bus buried under the crater. Holy hole, Batman. In the 1940s, Texas University and the WPA, the Works Project Administration, dug a 165-foot hole to find out once and for all if there was a giant space rock under the crater. There was no meteorite. It was just a very hard, sedimentary conglomerate of iron, sand, and crystalline rocks. The shaft was dug by hand. They used just shovels and picks. Eventually, they hit bedrock. 
At that point, I'm sure they had jackhammers, but it was still basically hand labor. They got down to 165 feet and drifted a tunnel. A fire in the 1950s destroyed the wooden support structure, leaving just the bare dirt walls. The possibility of a cave-in makes it far too dangerous to enter. The county poured this slab to cover it so people and livestock would not fall in it. Jeff and Steve examine the strata of the exposed dirt shaft. They're looking for even the slightest evidence of meteorites that might have been overlooked by previous generations. Holy cow, they dug that by hand. It's huge. Dropping the camera down the shaft, they find exactly what everyone else has found. Nothing. Wow, official. It's Hogwarts. returned from its uh, journey to the center of the Earth. There is no giant meteorite at the bottom of uh, the Odessa crater. Most of the impactor was completely vaporized. This is a very, very high energy event. The, the impact of an object that was many tens of feet across at very high velocity, and most of the impactor was completely vaporized in the event. Dr. Minakshi Wadwa is director of Arizona State's world-renowned meteorite studies department. She has extensively researched these astral travelers, from their very origins to their impacts left on our planet. The type of meteorite that landed is an iron meteorite, and it is one of the asteroidal types of meteorites. So these are thought to actually come from the core belt, and eventually they made their way to the Earth. The first meteorite I ever picked up was from the Odessa meteor crater. And it was a thrill to touch something that came from outer space. Tom Rodman. Space. Tom Rodman. This is the only significant meteorite crater anywhere in the United States that you can walk through, and it's free. It's a documented fact that Odessa once had plenty of meteorites. Whether any big ones are left is the burning question. I'm about worn out. I could go for another whole day. Could you? Oh, yeah, easy. Well, I can Two just days. come back here and pick you up in the morning. Yeah, that'd be fine. We were out pushing it, getting exhausted, but we're trying to make the most of what we can. And uh, got that big signal. We've got a really good target right there in the middle of the road. And we don't usually dig in the road because it's usually trash. But stranger things have happened. I'll tell you what, if you dig, I'll, I'll keep your uh, progress checked. How's, how's that? You're doing very well. Thank you. That was, that was a good shovel fool. Do you think it might be a pipe? Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Now, the side road leading out of area number two has just become search area number three. Steve, you want to double check my pinpointing on this? Wow. Perfect. Right, right there in the center. Yep, still there. We must dig an even deeper hole. Hey. Hey, what? Do we have a post hole digger? We do, actually. We may have to come back in the morning. We may. But let's give it a couple more minutes. What could be zinc and be that big? A zinc mine? A big ball of tin foil, man. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Well, I suppose we better fill it in since it's in the middle of the road and we'll come back tomorrow. All right. We do some crazy things, but digging in the middle of the road after dark is probably not really a great idea, even for us. So we're going to call it a day and come back tomorrow, and we've got a backhoe tomorrow, right? Yeah. So the backhoe will get this out in five minutes, and then we can discover if it is a real meteorite, or as Steve has predicted, a big ball of tinfoil. Next morning, the trusty backhoe hits area number three to fight through the rock-hard desert road. They're hoping for a big find in an unlikely spot. We brought the uh, bobcat backhoe in to, to make a quick job out of it this time. 
No hole's gonna beat us, I tell you that. You are right on the money. Okay, a little bit more, please. You are spot on target. Does that sound like a crunch to you? That's sticking to something. No, that doesn't look very good. Not another pipeline. God, that's annoying. Another oil pipe, another media wrong. There's always these rumors that a, a stream field's been hunted out, and I don't believe it for a minute. And then you come out here, and you hunt, and you hunt, and you hunt, and you hunt, and you don't find anything. And I'm starting to believe that this crew of old timers, I'm kind of thinking they've done a real good job. They've searched three areas and found one little rock. With a limited permit, time becomes their enemy. Steve and Jeff scramble to area number four, a small crater 375 feet from the big one. We think that this is actually an excavation pit that was dug in the 1940s to recover a very large meteorite. There, there's 10 holes out here uh, that they dug, and one of them had 600 pounds of, of meteorites or combined rocks that had disintegrated in, in the holes. Steve and Jeff truck in the smart cart ground penetrating radar system to search the pit like never before. This system sends and receives electromagnetic waves within the subsurface of the Earth. Ground penetrating radar, or GPR, uses pulses of high powered radio waves to bounce off buried objects. The system uses a transmitter to send high frequency radio waves up to 15 feet deep into the ground. Within fractions of a second, the return signal is received and a rough image is displayed along with the exact coordinates and the depth of the object. Unlike the metal detectors we usually use, which deliver an audio signature, we get a visual return from the ground penetrating radar. We actually get to look on a little panel that gives us a simplified snapshot of what exists beneath the surface. It's fantastic. And a skilled operator can analyze the return signal and say, there's something hidden under the ground. The search of area number four begins. Definitely got stuff going on here. What'd you pick up? A bullet shell. Um, how about if I walk two lines this way? OK. And see how that works. All right. We got a, a change here. Looks like a vertical object. I can run it over here again and check yeah. right here right in this area. We found right. something. You know, you, you can you can hunt by sight. You can hunt with a little $1,000 metal detector. You can hunt with a $3,000 metal detector. Or you can get something there. Hey, what you got? I've got an anomaly on the screen, and it's different from the rest of the surface. Oh, yeah. And it's uh, Look, Jeff. right in front of us. And you can see it right there. All right. What do we dig? What do we bring in the backhoe? It's hot and muggy. I think we should bring in the little portable digger. Let's go deeper, please. And could you widen that a little bit on either side? But I, I think we're right about here. Thanks. The digging is a delicate process, a mechanical ballet between machine and detectors, with the goal to never damage the target. Whoa. That sounded like something, maybe. Run your thing over. I'm not getting anything. Still down there. It's like there's a cave, a hollow. Let's have them go a little deeper. The thing that makes me feel that this is real is the, the way the strata are, yeah. are all smashed up here, as if there, maybe there was a big impact separate from the main mass that punched into the ground here and was in a pit. There was something there. Is it saying Ferris on your? Yes, it is. I'm getting a nice green light. Wow. It's still down there. That's kind of encouraging. That's really encouraging.
Genuine Schlitz beer. <laughs> Contents 12 ounces, made in the USA. It's amazing, actually, with all the gear that we have, but we, we haven't really found anything significant. But I think we were figuring that it would be easy. relatively easy to come in here with better detectors and we'd just find all these pieces that they missed, and that's just not happened. <laughs> Time is running out, and Steve and Jeff are desperate. It's time to widen the net, and they move out to the expansive area number five, the next concentric circle. Turn the propellers on. <laughs> They're working. <laughs> cool. Just in case we run into a swamp. Oh, OK. Well, you never know in Texas. This is the Hydra Trek, or the Rock Hound, as the guys call it. It's an amphibious, multi-purpose vehicle that has yet to meet a terrain it can't conquer. Well, the Hydra Trek's just about the best thing ever. It's the perfect speed for dragging the big meteorite detector. And the wide tracks mean we can go right over rough ground. And it turns really easily as well. They use the Rockhound to tow a deep earth metal detector that Steve custom designed. It has 50 feet of coil strung through it and can detect meteorites 10 to 12 feet deep. With a magnetic array this large, they can cover a lot of ground in their quest for large pieces. In simple terms, the larger your coil, the deeper into the ground the signal can travel. So if we're looking for large targets that are very deeply buried, we want to have a really big coil. It's also possible the strewn field, the area where the meteorites landed after the blast, is larger than the early meteorite hunters thought. So the detector is all assembled, the hydro track's ready to go, and the last thing we do is the shovel test. This is to make sure that the coil is working. That's what we want to hear when we're zooming out there over the wild lands. A nice shrill whine means a big iron target. Let's hit it. Oh yeah. That was a monster target. Could that be an oil pipe? Are we on anything? It could be anything. We uh, just got a huge target over there. Real nice, big, loud, shrieky. Wow. If you, if you walk along this line, if it's a pipeline, you'll get a continuous signal all the way. That is a very long, skinny <laughs> meteorite. I was just going to say the same thing. <laughs> or, or maybe a pipe. pipeline. All right. You know, the day's young. We're still laughing about this. At least we didn't have to dig that one. 62,000 years ago, this wasn't a laughing matter. The power of the impact would have equaled the power of multiple nuclear bombs. This event would have probably exterminated life within many miles in, in every direction, probably by the shock wave and the heat generated by an explosion of that size. It, it would be devastating by an explosion of that size. It, it would be devastating if it happened in a major city. Thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, would, would be killed or injured. So luckily for us, these impacts don't happen too often, and so far, They've happened in relatively unpopulated areas or before there were people. And not to mention, if one of the meteorites landed on your head, it would turn. That'd be quite a good epic. That Steve Arnold meteorite hunter's head in a jar in the Smithsonian with a space rock embedded in it. I like it. After sweeping acres of new ground in area number five, still nothing. We found there's a really long pipe, uh, but other than that, that's all so far. The guys abandon the rock hound and do some in-close hunting with their trusty metal detectors. We'll get out here and get working, so. Walk some of this off, walk some of the frustration off, and who knows? 
from the pattern distribution of the old map that we looked at that pieces were found about a half a mile east and west and about a yeah. mile north. So we should be... Maybe out of the boundary. We're in a promising zone. Uh -huh. Potential, anyway. While searching in area number five, they spot something that appears oddly out of place. This looks like what came out of the... around the crater. We're out here in the middle of brush, and all of a sudden, there's a big rock and some medium-sized pieces. We've certainly seen this phenomenon at other craters, notably Meteor Crater in Arizona, where large pieces of materia called ejecta are actually thrown out of the crater by the force of the impact. And uh, it would be logical to assume that there might be meteorites mixed in with the rocks that had been thrown out. I'm Hopefully, sure. maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's as good a place as any, I'd say. Well, let's find some. With the sun setting, their last shot is to try by hand in an area that turned up a number of meteorites in the past. They're still holding out hope for the big one that got away. Holy cow. Well, that does sound good. I like that sound a lot. Pinpoint it. Let's dig it. Sounds very metal. Oh, boy. Look how soft this is. This is more like it, isn't it? <laughs> that looks unpleasantly man-made. Boy, doesn't it? What would a pipe be doing out here? Ooh, it's a drill bit, no? I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's like a shower head. Wow. Whoa. <laughs> OK. Yeah, a big bolt or something. Oh, that's so unfair. All that digging for that bolt, that's not very nice. That's three targets in about 30 feet, and they were all junk. After three long days and only one small find, Jeff and Steve are about to declare this hunt one of their least successful. We're finding a lot of scrap and pipelines and um, beer cans. Beer cans, yeah. Oh well. Oh well. Yeah, I wish we would have pulled an 800 pounder out of the ground, but we gave it our best shot. And, you know, if, if there happened to have been one under where we were at, we would have found it. We didn't. Then, as they pull out of the Odessa crater area. Hey, wait, 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 stop. What? Stop. Did you see that? The dark thing. Get out. Get out. We're out. We're, we're, we're three quarters of a mile from the crater on the opposite side, where they say there's nothing. And it's all up and down the road. Look. There's a meteorite. <laughs> Check this one out, Jeff. There's a piece of it. Oh, look at that piece. Ooh. It's a pretty good one. We're looking for all kinds of technology to get more advanced in ways in finding things. And, and Jeff was driving. I was like, hey, wait. <laughs> Stop just a minute, Jeff. Oh, look. Another one right here. Another one right here. I got out and. There's these little black magnetic pieces of rock. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. And it just keeps going. We started looking, and there's more and more. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, 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 I can't, I can't leave this. These may be fragments of a very large piece that exploded, rained down over this area. Check this out, Jeff. With your detector. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Who likes that one? Kind of fist size. Look at that. <laughs> this is the craziest thing in the world. I'm going with the hypothesis that a meteorite, maybe a 200 pounder, got dug up, dumped in a dump truck, and the dump truck dumped it, and the road grader just spread it out. Steve came up with a really good name. He stubbed this fine avenue. Meteorite Road. Yeah. And this whole road seems to be graveled in meteorite shale. What's shale, Jeff? So <laughs> shale is a term that we use to describe a partially weathered 
iron meteorite. Some of the iron has terrestrialized. It's still magnetic, it's still a meteorite, but it's not, it's not quite as dense and heavy as a pure iron meteorite. So they it's are weather. It's extraterrestrial. Yeah. It's from outer space. We're it's... not we're not picky. And the race is on, ladies and gentlemen. Oh my God. Steve, you're encroaching on my territory. I am, I know. Who knows? There there could be something really solid in here, or there could just be more of these little ones. I think but we hey, should, uh, the sun's do, sun's do going down, so let's find some more. <laughs> now it helps if your back is to the sun, because this direction, everything has a shadow. But from this direction, anything that's dark, it's not a shadow. Like this, I was standing right on this one. I couldn't see it from the other direction. This direction, it stands way out. Here's a bunch of little ones here. I mean, they just, they just, they just pop out. Steve, it's, it's really odd. You just go, if you go a few more feet down there, there's just nothing. It just stops all of a sudden. This was the last piece that I found just over there. The last piece. Why do I find that hard to believe? I mean the furthest the field. Oh. So Jeff said they all stopped back there because he walked 20 feet and didn't find any. I've already collected 10 or 15 pounds. That's two or $3,000. This is crazy. There we go. Look at this. There, there might be something solid down inside there. This is hefty. How cool. Look at that. Steve, the one I found is better than all of yours. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's really nice. It's shaped like the Pope's hat. Like the Pope's hat? Yeah. It's really interesting that it just, and then they just stop. They're just, they're just none down here. And Jeff thought it ended right there. They're still here. I wonder if there's anything up to the side of the road. You want to check that out. And remember, watch out for rattlesnakes. Look at this, buddy. Woo! How many rattles does he have? Quite a few. A dozen of them, maybe? Oh, look at that. There's a, he's like crawling right over this meteorite. <laughs> yeah, there doesn't seem to be anything out here. It's just pieces on the road. And... <laughs> oh. Tin foil. See, on a day when you're not finding anything, this is about the time of day you start getting really hungry. When you're finding stuff, you don't even notice it. There's nothing down here. Yeah, you're right, Jeff. They probably stopped back there. God, did you hear that? Steve just said I was right about something. You must have sunstroke. Yeah, Jeff, nothing down here. I've been told that there is nothing. We've heard that before. Oh, don't hunt there. We even have colleagues that have said, no, don't go there. There's nothing there, usually because they know there is. Wow. OK, there's one. <laughs> There's one. <laughs> it's multi-thousands of dollars, all of those pieces. And of course, we get something that's really solid, and you can cut open. Oh, there's one. Uh, and have shiny metal in it, have a pattern in it. Oh. Then, yeah, those are going to be worth quite a bit more. There is scientific value in proving that there are still meteorites. And to the best of our knowledge, no pieces had been found in that specific area. Now, this is dangerous, folks, because if we put this on TV, people are going to just be flooding out here. Another one right here. Look at this. That's a pretty impressive piece. Yeah. In the, for, in the middle of the road or anywhere. <laughs> well done. I think, I think there's something solid in there. If we cut them open, they're shiny, the Whitman Staten structure's inside. That's going to be worth our trouble. I like that one. After just two hours on Meteorite Road, the guys dig up an astonishing 65 pounds of meteorites, worth at least $10,000. Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> if half of the battle for the meteorite hunter is to find the rock, oh, I, can't, I can't leave this. The other half is figuring out where it came from. The Odessa crater is one of the few sort of impact craters that 
you can see remnants of on the Earth's surface still. Anything that we can find on the surface of the Earth that can tell us something about impact processes in the past is, of course, valuable because we can learn something about uh, the history, the past history of impacts on, on our planet that way. At Arizona State University, the Department of Meteorite Sciences is well equipped to analyze meteorites. Inside these labs, they not only determine their weight and size, but more importantly, their composition. So this is a piece of the Odessa iron meteorite, and you can see here some of the hollows and some of the shapes that you see here. It's a typical texture that you see in iron meteorites called a regmaglypt texture or a thumbprint texture. And that happens as a result of the atmospheric interaction of the meteorite as it's sort of ablating in the atmosphere. It's actually getting so hot on the exterior surface that it's actually vaporizing off some of the material on the surface and losing some mass as a result of that. Five hours east of the crater is a place that specializes in Odessa irons, the Monig Meteorite Gallery at TCU, Texas Christian University. Dr. Art Elman is the curator and an expert on these meteorites. You guys want to see the Odessa we have here in the collection? <sighs> that is just a little bit bigger than the ones we found. But the ones we were looking for. Well, this one's 120 pounds. That's one of the nicer big pieces. Oh, it's of definitely nice. But Steve and Jeff didn't come here just to admire the Odessa irons. They wanted to see how their rocks stacked up. I need to see what you find out there. Shall we compare and contrast? Well, OK. Well, those are, uh, those are nice ones, because Odessas are hard to find now. I think it's very interesting how similar these yeah. are, actually. Yeah. Same color, similar shape, surface kind features. Kind of staining, yeah. patina oxidation. So how confident are you that this is a real meteorite and then it's an Odessa meteorite? Number one, the heft would tell me right away it's not a, a normal Earth rock. Especially being found yeah. a mile away from the, the crater. Proximity to the Odessa crater is, is the best argument right there without actually cutting it and doing some an analysis on it. And we need to cut it right across the middle here and cut it in two pieces and then look at that face and etch it. And there you see go. If okay. it looks like an Odessa then. Dr. Art Elman knows there's only one way to authenticate that the meteorites Jeff and Steve found are Odessa irons. Cutting a nice surface and see if it has nice uh, vidment state and figures that, that would be 99.9% that was needed. Of the 65 pounds of meteorite shale that Steve and Jeff collected, a sample was shipped to ASU for further studies. Lawrence Garvey is the collections manager for the Center of Meteorite Studies. Steve and Jeff's sample is sliced, diced, and polished. Then Lawrence compares it with the Odessa control sample. He'll either declare Steve and Jeff's find as extraterrestrial rocks or just plain old Texas gravel. Jeff and Steve sent me a piece that they had found, and then I took one, one of the pieces from our collection just, just to look for any differences and similarities. And it's fairly evident that they're both very, very similar. What is found is an iron meteorite. It's called the 1AB complex. It's a type of meteorite that has a large amount of silicate and, and iron sulfide type inclusions in it. One test will reveal if the two irons are a match. It compares what is known as the cosmic fingerprint of an iron meteorite, the vidman staten pattern. This pattern is named after Count Alois von Beck vidman staten of Vienna, Austria, who in 1808 made the discovery with just a Bunsen burner, causing distinctive bands to appear. Here's a perfect example of an iron meteorite with a well-developed vitamin staten pattern. And see these, these nice bright linear features that we see are camasite. The camasite is crystallized along the crystal planes of the high temperature form. And the nickel that's expelled makes the, um, makes the what, what we call the tainite bands, the, the darker bands in there. Count Widman Staten's Bunsen burner is no longer used, but today the process is essentially the same. It's performed with a high-speed diamond polishing. And now we're going to put it in the nitile. Nitile is nitric acid and, and methanol. 
followed by a lovely acid bath that reveals the true Widmann-Staten pattern in the university sample. Okay, here we see a classic section of the Odessa meteorite. This is from our collection. We see a skeletonized Schreiberzite grain here. That's this thing here. But you see this black rim. It's actually a shiny rim around it. And that's coenite, which is iron carbide. Here we see the nice coarse Wittmannstatten pattern. And a characteristic feature of Odessa is the, the width of the camasite lamellae. The camasite lamellae define the Wittmannstatten pattern. So that's that width there. And since this is calibrated, we can tell that's about one, that's about two, that's about two. So it's about, it's just under two millimeters. And the average width for the camasite lamellae in Odessa is about 1.7. So it's, it's, it's perfect, it's, it's as we expect. Now the rock that the guys found in the road faces the final test. Now, the sample that Jeff and Steve sent has a well-developed Wittmann-Staten pattern, which is great. The width of the, I mean, very developed, well-developed camasite lamellae here, and the width, if we look at several, I mean, it's absolutely, it's, it's the same as, the, as our Odessa sample. It's just under two millimeters. So, so we can say that the width of the, of the camasite lamellae are consistent with Odessa. Hello, this is Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hello, Lauren. Hey, how are you doing? I'm very good, thanks. Hey, I've got your, I've got your meteorite sitting in front of me. Have you got some news for us? This is a, a, a beautiful example of the Odessa meteorite. Really? Well-developed, coarse Wittmann-Staten pattern. Did you have a chance to compare it to the Odessa specimen in the reference collection? As we would expect, they're pretty much identical. Well, no great surprise, because we, we found it in fairly close proximity to the crater, but it, the whole thing was just so weird, finding them in the road. The bulk of the IME site is beautiful. OK, Lawrence, thanks for everything. We really appreciate it. And good luck with your future hunting. Thanks, bye. He said there's no weathering on the inside. It's, it's solid iron nickel all the way through, and it's got a beautiful etched woodman satin pattern. So we did all right on that one. We did, after all. All right. Let's go find one now. Yeah. <laughs> Makes you want to go find another That'd one. That would be the it? only better news, really, would be to even find something else. It's one thing to find a meteorite on the surface, but to go to a crater, a feature in the Earth that's actually being gouged out of the ground by an enormous space rock crashing into the surface, and then find meteorites, the evidence of this cataclysmic impact. It's a way that we can see how these rocks from outer space have actually changed the surface of the planet upon which we live.